my good people. Welcome again to our very next, our very next talk, the Vandy Christian Network, and our program, A Walk Through the Scriptures. Today, we're back again. I'm always excited to be here with you, and I'm always um, grateful for you, our viewers, um, for our regular um, relentless viewers, and even our new viewers that join us every day on a daily basis. And the only thing I can ask of you is just please make sure you subscribe, you press on the notification button, and you share this message. When you see a, you share a message like this, there's a reward in heaven, and God will wish you a blessing. Today, we're going to talk on um, um, a teaching I titled, Broken to be a Blessing. Broken to be a blessing. The past participle of break, when you break something. <laughs> Broken to be a bless, broken to be a blessing. You know, someone once said, and I say this, um, I will echo it and echo it and emphasize on it that brokenness is the only diet that can reduce a fat head. <laughs> what a saying! Brokenness is the only diet that can reduce a fat head. No matter how big and fat that head is, when that head is broken, it can be reduced. So today we're going to talk on what I titled, Broken to be a Blessing. Let's turn our Bibles to um, Psalms 51 verse 17. That's our memory verse, Psalms 51 verse 17. Psalm 51 17 reads, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou will not despise. Just one just one verse. That's it. That's where the inspiration came about for me to write this message. Broken to be a blessing. Of course, we all know what's broken when something breaks. You know, when something is broken, it can be reduced to fragment or fragmented, or um, when something um, fails to function properly, or when something um, um, does not work at all, or when something is not in order. Of course, we know blessings and acts of words. Um, when you receive something special or a favor or merit or something you do not even merit you know from God Almighty or a benefit um, and I'll say it again bless brokenness is the only diet that can reduce a fat head turn to your neighbor and tell your neighbor brokenness is the only diet that can reduce um, a fat head so I'm pretty much sure I'm very much confident that you're out there with your um, notepads your writing materials, your pens, your pencils, and so on and so forth. Most Christians today don't take risk for God at all. We don't attempt something great for God. Instead, we sit in our comfort zones, living by sight instead by living by faith. Why? Because we are afraid. We don't want to um, to be stripped of our comfort zones. Tell me, let me tell you something here. Sitting in the natural, living by sight and not by faith is miserable. Until you experience the supernatural power of God doing the impossible, you have not experienced God yet. It's a bold statement and I mean what I said and I always say what I mean. I repeat, until you experience the supernatural power of God doing the impossible, you haven't experienced God yet. Have you experienced in your life when you feel like you are broken in pieces? I know about you, maybe you're perfect, but me, I'm not. I've been there. Have you been there? I'm pretty much sure you must have been there. You, you, and you. I've been in a situation in my life where I was broken into pieces. And I'll tell you what, when you recover from such experience, more than likely you are stronger and a more mature person. Amen belongs there. Have you experienced the Lord walking in your life by stripping you off something you thought is really your source of confidence? It is your security blanket, if you may like. It is your identity. Some people are known by certain things. When you mention their name, they will name it. What do I mean by this? 
There are things or people in our lives that we that are so intertwined with our identity that we feel if we give them up, we will never be the same again. And then when the Lord begins to work in our lives and he starts taking them away, pulling those security blankets away from us, we feel the hurt. Oh, absolutely, we feel it. But later, we will see that he, God Almighty, has a higher purpose in what he's doing. There is one thing about God stripping you of your security blanket, whatever you may call it. There is one thing about God taking those things where your confidence lies. One thing I will tell you for certain that there is one thing you must never forget. When God is stripping you off of that security blanket, whatever it may be, whatever that's causing you confidence in yourself, it's because he wants to build you up. He wants you to place your confidence in him. He wants to build you up, place your confidence in God. Today, I'm going to introduce to you uh, two characters, but in terms of time, we'll talk about one character in a future we will continue this message in another form where I'll introduce another character to you. But let me talk about one character. This character is very popular in the Bible. And that character is not a person, but allow me to introduce to you the man I call Peter. Or I may say Peter. Or some will pronounce it Peter. Today we're going to talk about Peter's encounter with Jesus. The event, the series of events that Jesus and Peter experienced together. Or I may refer to them as the episodes with the Lord of hosts. But it is impossible to talk about the encounter with the Lord without knowing and understanding the man Peter himself. What a man, Peter. Let's turn our Bibles to um, 1 Peter um, chapter 1, verse 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. I just want to make a brief introduction about the man himself, the man Peter himself. Some may say Peter, some may call him Peter, depends on your... Um, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. It says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Portos, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bethlehem. Peter was one of the most vocal, if not the most vocal of all Jesus' disciples. Peter was not a sort of bloke who left you wondering what he was thinking about. He's, Peter was not the man that would bite his tongue. He says it as it is. Peter was the man who told it straight and had a bit of colorful language in there as well. I hope you understand what I mean. He's that kind of guy who says with a colorful language, say it that, just like that. Even the master Jesus <laughs> will cop <laughs> will cope a mouthful from Peter. <laughs> Peter often spoke before he thought. Also, Peter was the disciple who got into the most troubles. But he was the disciples who had the greatest influence bringing the message of the Lord Jesus Christ to the world. Peter's life was so rich with systematic and consistent stripping on the part of the Lord Jesus Christ of all the things that were causing him to have false confidence. All of the things that were causing him to have pride. All of the things that were causing him to have outward courage. All of the things that were causing him to have self-adequacy. All of the things that were placing his pride in the wrong places. My question is, or the question you may ask me as we are walking through the scriptures together, why would Jesus do that when he knew it hurt so much with dealing with Peter? Why would he do that? Why would he take away his security blankets? But the answer to that question is simple. It is in order for him to build him up. Jesus wanted to build Peter up 
So that Peter will be that man of God whose confidence will be in God alone. <laughs> Have you been there? We are in God is taking things that you depend on, stripping you naked. Have you been there? The answer, like I said, because Jesus wanted to build him up. Jesus wanted him to place his confidence in God Almighty. Now, Peter's name occurred in all four Gospels. Check it out. We are walking through the scriptures. The Bible says, Show thyself to be approved by workmen, should not be ashamed. So we, did, we always do our homework. I did my part. Peter's name was mentioned on, in all four Gospels. In fact, Peter's name occurred more times in all of the Gospels than any of the apostles put together. <laughs> Peter spoke more often than all of the apostles put together. Peter boldly, more boldly confesses Christ more than all the apostles. So I'm giving the good and the bad. We need to know about this man Peter so I can tell you in order, so I can tell you the encounters he had with Jesus. Peter interrupted. Peter interfered. <laughs> Peter intruded. Peter tempted Jesus more than any of the others. And of course, Peter was rebuked more than all of the other disciples. However, Peter was introduced to the Lord by his brother Andrew. Andrew was a quiet guy. Very completely opposite to Peter. Complete opposite. But uncharacteristically one day, he ran to his brother and told him about the Messiah. <laughs> now, Peter was that kind of man or that kind of person who always wants to be the center of attention. We have people like that in the church, right? In our society, right? So, no, so one can imagine what was playing in Peter's mind. Maybe Peter was saying to himself, <laughs> if the Messiah is here, he needs to come find me. Because obviously he's going to need me. He's not going to make it in this town without my advice. He's not going to make it in this town without my support. Me, Peter. Me, Simon Peter. Normally, it takes Peter to make things happen in the community. In his community. And that was why Jesus had to strip him down. During all of those times he was with the Lord of his false confidence. Why? That's a million dollar question, why? And we have an answer because you and I, we are walking through the scriptures. The reason, the answer is very simple like ABC. So that it might build him up to be a powerhouse for God. Because nobody can be a powerhouse for God. And nobody can be effective for God when they have self-confidence. When their confidence is in their own ability. God does not share the glory with any man. But with all what happened, with all the chains or the series of events recorded in the Bible about Peter or between Peter and Jesus, there are six, five or six, but I'll be most precise, pivotal moments, significant moments of, of Peter's life that we're going to learn today. There are moments that change his life. Have you been there? We are in your experience moments or encounters in life that will make you change. And people will be like, wow. We are going, I'm going to teach you today by the help of the Holy Spirit. As the Holy Spirit led, put it in my heart, led it, gave me the wisdom to put this information together. We are going to learn about these moments in Peter's life that change his life forever. There are these moments that are very essential in his life that made him to be the man he was that contributed in the spreading of the gospel. These are the moments that made him rely on God's strength. There are moments that, that were very 
that were in fact invaluable in Peter's life. Now, where was Peter's security blanket? Or where was his strength? Or where was his confidence? I tell you what, his confidence were in two basic areas. I hope you're taking note. Two basic areas in Peter's life. When I studied about this man Peter, I learned a lot. I see some of the attributes in myself, but thank God. That's why I said, brokenness, it is the only diet that can reduce a fat head. Broken to be a blessing. You cannot be a blessing for God to the, to the generation if, without being broken. This man is talking to you, teaching you God's word. I've gone through such. We're broken into pieces. <laughs> Peter's security blanket we are in one sea and his profession was fishing. He was a fisherman. The sea and the fishing and number two, outward courage and self-confidence. Self-adequacy. Self-boasting. And Jesus disciplined Peter in those two areas of Peter's life. He hauled them like a laser beam. A disciplined Peter. Encounter number one. Let's turn our Bibles to John chapter 21, verse 6 to 7. John chapter 21, verse 6 to 7. John 21, 6 to 7. John 21, 6 to 7. I read from here. The Bible says, as we walk through the scripture, this same scripture as we're walking through teaches us in John 21, 6 to 7. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the sheep, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. <laughs> 7. Therefore the disciples whom Jesus loved said unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he, he got his fishes, his fishes coat unto him, for he was naked and did cast himself into the sea. I call this ouch number one. This was the first episode. Now, Peter fished all night. Caught nothing, nothing absolutely. I believe he was boldly tired. He came to shore and he saw Jesus Stayed around to listen, and Jesus told Peter and the others to go along with him to go in the middle of the sea and in the middle of the day to go fishing. <laughs> I wonder what was playing on Peter's mind when the Lord of hosts told him to throw his net in, in the sea in the middle of the day. By the way, with my little knowledge, when I was back home in Sierra Leone in Wellington, we used to go to Olaf, and there is no way you can see the fishermen in the, um, in the middle of the day, no way. That's not the best time to catch fish. So I wonder what was playing in his mind. You know, being that man who believes in himself. When the Lord told him to throw um, um, uh, his net in the middle of the day. And I, I cannot just imagine Peter saying, Lord, I have a repetition to protect. Maybe Peter was even tempted to say, Lord, you know, I know you are the greatest one. I know you are the greatest miracle worker, but leave fishing to me. Because my name is Simon Peter. Fishing is my business. I've been doing fishing <laughs> throughout my childhood and my adult life as well. I love fishing. Have you been there? Have you been where at the very point of your own adequacy, where in your own self-adequacy has been challenged by God? Have you been in a situation where in the essence of your self-confidence, it's been challenged by God Almighty. You might be tempted to resist or do both. We know the rest of the story. They caught fish. Not only one, but they filled two boats. That was what I can refer to. Lesson number one. Mark it down. What is Jesus doing? Jesus was making sure that when Peter became a powerhouse for God, self-boasting will be under control. Self-boasting and self-confidence will be under the control of the Holy Spirit of God. 
Encounter number two. Let's turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 8, verses 23 to 27. Matthew 28, 23 to 27. Also write it down, Mark 4, 35 to 40. You may go read it. But I'll read Matthew 8, 23 to 27. Matthew 8, 23 to 27. Matthew 8, 23 to 27. I'll read it from here. Matthew 8, 23 to 27. It reads, And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but Jesus was asleep. And his disciples came to him and woke him up, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he said unto them, Why are ye fearful, O ye of little faith? Then they arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. But the man marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? What a God will serve, huh? Now, Peter was a born leader. There was nothing wrong with that. And I'm convinced that Jesus had no problem with that as well. The Lord Jesus Christ wanted to make sure that Peter will not become a problem leader, like some of the problematic or the problem leaders we have in our churches today, or in the community societies, or in government, in politics. Peter had pride problems. Peter had self-boasting problems. Peter had self-confidence problems. Peter had self-adequacy problems, and most of them, if not all of them, were related to the sea and fishing. And not just any sea, but the Sea of Galilee. That's where he was born. That's where he grew up. And that was his home. Most of his days were spent there. And that was where Jesus had an encounter with him again, again, and again, and again. This time around in Matthew, uh, in the, according to the account of Matthew 8, 23 to 27, or Mark 4, 35 to 40, Jesus was in a boat with his disciples, and as soon as they left for sea, suddenly a fierce and a furious tempest struck with waves breaking into the boat, but Jesus was asleep. It was sound asleep. Jesus was sleeping in the boat. It went into a rage, and they were all panicked. Guess who panicked the most? If you guess Peter, then you guess right. <laughs> Imagine. What was playing or what was going on in Peter's mind? Peter maybe was thinking to himself, I thought I know the lake or this sea, particularly the Sea of Galilee. I thought I know this sea like the back of my hand. I thought I know this lake. I thought I'm an, I am an expert in this area. I thought I knew how to take care of myself, but oh no, not at this time. I've never panicked before. I've always had confidence in myself and in what I do and what I know. But not at this point. That's what I call lesson number two. Encounter or episode number two. Jesus, with all authority, commanded the storm to be calm. And the storm obeyed. Why? Because God incarnate has spoken. When he speaks, it becomes a law, it must, it, it happens immediately. This brought me, brought you and I to episode or encounter number three. En encounter number three is given to us by Matthew in Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 to 23. Matthew 14, 22 to 23. Now, this encounter happened right in Peter's ex expertise and adequacy. Again, right in his area of self-confidence. Right in the middle of another storm. Right here in Galilee. But by now, Peter had begun to exchange his false confidence with confidence in God. <laughs> I said he has begun. Take note of that. In Matthew chapter 14, verses 22 to 23, the Bible gave us an account that Jesus was not with them in the boat this time. But as they were going, Jesus came walking on water. 
He was walking on the waters, and most of them did not realize it was Jesus. They thought it was a ghost. Until he came closer. Now Peter has just begun to put his trust in the Lord Jesus. And he asked, Jesus, if it is you, tell me to come and I'll walk on water. You see? He has started having confidence in God now. Confidence in the Lord. If it was before, he could have said something different. And Jesus allowed it to be so because he professed confidence. He, what in, he, he had confidence in what he said and he believed it was going to happen. It happened. Jesus called him and Peter, besides Jesus, was also, the, or the only ordinary human being that walked on waters. He was walking, but hey, when he turned and he realized what was going on, he lost a little bit of faith and he almost drowned. But thank God for Jesus. Someone said, thank God for Jesus. Jesus Christ just showed him that no matter how bold he is, he was always going to drown until Jesus said, hey, man of little faith. We see in this passage, Peter's dependency on his self-sufficiency is lesson number three. He's now learning to trust in God. And he's learning the hard way. I'm sure Peter would have said or wish he had kept his mouth shut. Brethren, let me give the man Peter a little break and pause there a little bit. I want to tell you something. Something of vital, most important. If you think that God enjoys watching you going through spiritual growing pains, then you don't know the character of God. That's a bold statement. But I know it's true. If a human being or a human parent can hurt inside when they see their toddlers learning to, to walk and they fall, they feel the pain and the hurt. I remember when my girls, my daughters, when they were little, each one of them, when they get to that stage, each time they, 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 they're learning to take their steps, when they fall, I'll be like, trying to send my hands to catch them so that they'll hit the floor. So imagine, what about our Father in heaven? He feels the pain too. But let me tell you this fact. He wants you to grow up. He wants me to grow up spiritually. He knows that we ought to grow up. That's the same thing the mother eagle does to the eaglet. At a certain stage of the eaglet's life, the eaglet will not stay in that nest. The mother eagle will take that eaglet we fly right up in the sky and let the eaglet. The eaglet will get panic as if, but the mother eagle will not allow that eaglet to fall on the floor. But that's how the little eaglet will learn to fly. That little eagle learns how to fly the hard way. You cannot be a spiritual toddler for the rest of your life. The problem is that there are so many people who are spiritual toddlers in the churches today. That's why there is no growth in the churches. They, you, they don't want to walk. They don't want to get hurt. They don't want to suffer. So they sit like a baby in a high chair, waiting for someone to spoon feed them all the time. They let somebody else feed them, take care of them, do their work. No wonder the churches are full of 200,000 pounds babies sitting on a high chair. Let me come back to Mr. Peter. Episode number four. This account is in the scriptures, Matthew 26, 31 to 34. This was the night of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Jesus was preparing his disciples for what was about to come. And Peter was not paying attention at all. He was thinking about something else while the Lord was talking. He boasted again. And Jesus looked at him and said, Before dawn, you will deny me three times. He said, Peter, you will deny me three times today before day breaks, before the cock crows. Hmm. Probably that deeply hurt Peter the most. Let me seize this opportunity to speak to you, the Peters and the Peteresses. There's no one like that, it's just my own colloquial. The Peters and the Peteresses out there. Because there are some ladies, there are some women that also display the attributes of Peter. 
So the Peters and the Peteresses out there, I would like to inform you that God is not looking, nor is he impressed in your adequacies. Yes. God is not looking for, neither is he impressed in your adequacies. God is not even impressed in your self-confidence. God is not impressed in your ability to boast. But what there is one thing God is looking for. God is looking for your willingness to be stripped off all that is natural so that he can build you up with the supernatural. That's what, I'm, that's what God is looking for. The Bible says in our passage for today, in Psalm 51, 17, it says, A broken and a contrite heart God will not despise. There's a blessing in brokenness. In fact, we see this principle running in the Bible in symbolic terms and in real terms. All of the champions of God in the Bible were rebuilt, reframed, remodeled by God before, they sh before he showcases them. God knows what he's doing. When Jacob became broken in Penal, he was clothed with power. It was when the rock of all was broken by the rod of Moses that water gushed out to satisfy the thirst of the people. It was when Mary broke her expensive alabaster box and anointed the feet of Jesus. The aroma filled the room and he was anointed. When Jesus broke, Five loaves of bread distributed them and they became and they became multiplied and he fed more than five thousand people. And when our Lord Jesus Christ Himself was broken in his body, he was broken on that cross of Calvary, he was broken with thongs on his head, he was broken by nails, he was broken by spears, only then redemption came forth and you and I are saved today because of his broken body. There are blessings that come with brokenness. There are blessings in brokenness that the world in a million years will never, never understand. That's why I said earlier on that brokenness, otherwise humility or meekness is the only diet that will reduce a fat head. The Bible says in the Beatitudes that the meek will inherit the earth. So there is a blessing attached to it. Remember, the Bible also tells us that the earth is of the Lord and the fullness therein. And this earth is rich and God is so rich. And God said in his word in the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5 that the meek will inherit, inherit the earth. So you have to be broken for you to inherit this earth, people of God. It's only on this network you get teachers like this. In order for you to inherit the heart, you got to be broken, my brother. You got to be broken, my sister. Now let's go back. I've given Mr. Peter a break. Let's get back to Mr. Peter. I'm sure enough, before the cock crows, Peter turned into chicken. <laughs> he denied Jesus three times, just like Jesus said. And Jesus turned and looked at Peter. The Bible said, Jesus turned and looked at Peter. I tell you something about that look. Peter will never, never forget that look. Even in heaven right now, I know Peter will never forget that look. <laughs> but, it's a look that so many scholars may misunderstand. Peter, it wasn't that look that says, Peter, I told you so. No, Jesus does not operate like that. No. No, that's not the way Jesus works. It was a look that said, Peter, I still love you. And I'm ready to forgive you. Peter, I understand. That was what that look, that's the significance of that look. That was the meaning of that look. And I tell you what, the reason I know that is because when Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead, he had to have an encounter again, one-on-one -on -one with Peter. As if to say, Peter... This stripping you of all that stuff is not that I may hold it against you. No. No, but to forgive you. I pulled out all those false confidences. All those false adequacies. 
not to tear you down, Peter, but to build you up. Peter, I did these things because I love you. I want you to do great things for me, Peter. Peter, you have one option. Don't allow this to pull you down. Don't allow sorrow and self-pity to pull you down. But move forward in power. Because when Jesus turned and looked at Peter for the third time, the third denial, Peter busted, crying in tears. Peter cried like a baby. Encounter number six, the final encounter. Brethren, I tell you, you can focus on what you've lost and stay where you are. Or you can swing forward towards the goal and look forward to the game that only God can give you. I'll say it again. You can focus on what you've lost and stay where you are. That's your option number one. Or option number two, you can spring forward towards your goal and look forward to the game that only God can give you. <laughs> That's a broad statement. Write it down. Meditate on it. But the final encounter, then finally the encounter on the beach with the Lord. I call it the most famous encounter. Which scripture tells us in John 21 verse 1 to 19. The most famous encounter with Jesus on the beach was accounted for by Apostle John. This well-known encounter between the Lord Jesus Christ and Peter. The Lord looks at Peter and asks Peter, Do you really love me? To the point of dying for me? For that's what agape means. Peter, do you agape me? This was the Lord Jesus Christ asking Peter. Peter, at this moment, who is no longer Mr. Self Adequacy. Peter, at this moment, who is no longer Mr. Self Boasting. Peter, at this moment, who is no longer Mr. Self Confidence, said, Lord, I love you with human affection. That's what fellow means. Peter, do you agape me? Peter said, no, Lord, I fellow you. I love you with human affection. If it was before, before he was stripped of his self-confidence, he would have said, of course, Lord, you know that I love you. You are the rabbi, you know that. I left fishing, I left my family, I'm following you, you know I love you. But oh no. You can count on me, oh Lord. But now, that was a past Peter. Have you been there? Have you been in a situation where people look at you and say, wow, what happened? What has changed you? If you've never been there, I've been there. There are things I used to do. People that knew me back then were like, wow. I used to be that man who never bite my tongue. I'll never, I, 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 without hesitation, I'm like, I'm, I can't say, you know, you're not the one I'm talking to. I'll be like, yes, I'm referring to you. What can you do? You. Boldly, with, with no fear. But in life, when God wants to use you for a bigger purpose, there are certain things he takes away from you. He strips you. Makes you look powerless. And look forward to the goal. And he only will give you the game. I say this. Write it down. A man or woman in a hurry will miss his or way. If you chase gold, G-O-L-D, gold, you will miss your goal in life. But if you chase Jesus, it will give you the gold to fulfill your goals, G-O-A-L-S. Amen? Remember that. When you think of me or think of the Valley Christian Network, think of this program and walk through the scripture. Remember that. But now, the broken, the rebuilt, the reconstructed, the remodeled Peter had a different response. Jesus asked him again, Peter, do you agape me? 
Peter said, no, Lord, I follow you. I love you with human affection. And then for the third time and the final time, do you take notice of something? Jesus Christ asked Peter three times. Simply because, remember, Jesus Christ, Peter denied Jesus three times. And then the third time, one for each denial, Peter, do you even love me with friendship love? Brethren, it is easy to tell the Lord God how much we love him. But when rubber meets the road, can we really say, Lord, we love you? But the reconstructed and all so much wiser Peter now said, Lord, you know everything. You know my heart, Lord. I can't fool you anymore. I can fool everybody in the church, but I cannot fool you. Beloved, that's not the end of the story. By the time we get to Pentecost Day, Peter can stand with real courage. Peter can stand with real confidence, not in himself this time, but in the Lord Jesus Christ. With real adequacy, not in himself, but in the Lord Jesus Christ. With real power, not in himself, but in the Lord Jesus Christ. With the power of the Holy Spirit, can he stand on Pentecost Day and say, You have killed the Lord of hosts. Knowing fully well that he could have lost his life at that moment. And what happened? 3,000 gave their lives to Christ at the end of that famous sermon, the very first sermon I was preached in the Bible. Their number was added, 3,000 plus. Peter is a great example of our commitment to be a disciple of Jesus. It's a lifelong process of change. If you want to do this that I'm doing, you want to do more than I do, you want to do a work for God, you want to follow Jesus Christ, remember, you have to take up the cross. You have, it's a decision you have to make. And when you make that decision, don't turn him back. Remember this, the song that says, don't turn him back, don't turn him back. When you decide to follow Jesus, don't turn him back. Peter's example, his life is an example of a commitment, a great commitment to be disciples of Jesus. It's a lifelong process of change. He felt his fishing gear, he left his fishing gear business and followed Jesus. A little further on, he was confronted with his own sin and feelings of being unworthy. He was further confronted about his pride. On another occasion, his weak faith was exposed. He was embarrassed because he had fallen asleep right at a time when Jesus needed him to watch and be alert. In the garden when Jesus Christ took them. Every person who has met Jesus and decided to follow him will identify with Peter. And with these same areas of feelings, Peter failed many a time at a point wanted to give up, but God did not give up on him. Despite all his shortcomings and failures. Who told you you're the only one with shortcomings and failures? Why do you want to give up on God when God has not given up on you? If, if God had patience with Peter, what makes you think he will not have patience with you? The one thing that brought Peter to the end of his own strength and independence was when he denied Jesus three times. That hurt him the most. That hurt was deep. After that, he wept bitterly. Was that the end of the road? No. Would Jesus give up on Peter? No. Had he had too many feelings and too many opportunities? Peter almost had given up and was even reverting back to his former business and former lifestyle of fishing. He said to his friends, I am going back to fishing. Have you been there? Have you given up on God? Because of your sins and your failures in life? Jesus was waiting by the beach to once again meet with Peter. Jesus was not there to condemn Peter. He was, he was there wanting, not wanting to condemn you for your failures, but to encourage you and build you up and lift you up. Jesus met Peter to restore Peter. My people of God, I want to ask you this most important question that the Lord is posing to every one of us who claims to love him. The question is this. Are you willing to allow him to strip you off your, your, your self-pride? Are you willing to allow Jesus to strip you off your self-sufficiency? 
Are you willing to allow Jesus to strip you off your self-adequacy? Do you truly desire to be broken, rebuilt, and reconstructed by the Lord Jesus Christ himself? No matter how painful it may feel at the beginning. Are you willing to let go of your security blanket? Are you willing to stop clinging onto that blanket or that which you depend on so much? Whatever it is or whatever they are. Whether it's your reputation. Whether it's your, your education. Whether it's your world. Whether it's your acceptance. Or whatever it may be. Are you willing to boldly say, Lord, I know one thing. That when you strip me down, you will build me up in your strength and your supernatural power. These are the questions that sometimes make me to bang my head against the wall of confusion. I leave you with these questions. Again, are you willing to let Jesus strip you off? Whatever it is that is holding you bound or holding you captive, Whatever it is that is preventing you from giving your life to Christ. Whatever it is that's you, that makes you think it's you, 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 you. Please, today, be willing and allow Jesus Christ to break you down. Because when he strip you down of those things, he will build you up in his own strength, in his own power, supernatural power, and make you a powerhouse for God. God bless you. Shalom.